ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Gregory, Lord of Ross, and also you from, from the traditional Britain group for inviting me to be your afternoon speaker. I was t telling uh, Gregory you'll be thinking that perhaps you'll have to sue the, um, this group, uh, this uh, new Claremont group uh, <laughs> people, um, because there is a, a, a bit of legislation which is actually quite useful in terms of counterattacking on that sort of thing. It's under the uh, Equality Act. Uh, and what it says is that uh, basically they're not allowed to discriminate against people on the grounds of system of philosophical belief. System of philosophical belief was a phrase that was adopted as a result of the Redfern case. Redfern was a um, BMP activist uh, and a white race nationalist, uh, and uh, he was sacked from his, his job. He'd been, he'd been, he was, I think, a, a bus either driver or conductor up in Derbyshire. It stood in a Derby uh, local council, BMP, uh, and um, he, the month before, he'd been the employee of the month, and then he stood, and then he was sacked. And they came out with some nonsense about sort of health and safety or something, that uh, somebody might injure themselves whilst they were protesting about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and he was sacked. And, and, and that went all the way up to the um, European Court of Human Rights, and the European Court of Human Rights said, you shouldn't be discriminating against somebody for their political beliefs, uh, and uh, there ought to be a, a right for that not to happen, an enforceable right, and there is now an enforceable right, and that is a system of philosophical belief. So uh, the traditional Britain group has obviously got a system of philosophical belief. <laughs> they should sue, I, I, would, I would urge. And, uh, I'd, cert I'd certainly offer to help. Let me introduce myself. Um, as you can see, I've uh, created a little bit of a speech here at any rate. Um, so, uh, as Gregory kindly said, I'm the chairman and leader of the English Democrats. Uh, the English Democrats are uh, the only campaigning English nationalist party. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've been campaigning since we were launched in 2002. Um, we have now distributed well over 50 million leaflets. Um, I stood in the last police commissioner elections in Essex, where I live, uh, and I got 43,000 votes there. Um, I'm going to stand again um, next year. Um, I, um, I, I don't know whether I shall actually win in Essex, but uh, obviously I'm in with the chance. If the Conservative vote gets depressed to this extent which um, we're expecting, um, there are, uh, I think, 110,000 votes could well be down to the point where I might overtake them, in which case I should be the police commissioner. I will decide then what the policies will be for the Essex police. I will decide their budget. If anything I don't like the look of, they'll get zero on that budget. Uh, anything that I do like the look of, they will get a lot of money to do it. And, and I'll give you a for instance of how that, can be, um, how that actually works in practice. So, uh, Sadiq Khan. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so Tom, when he got elected as mayor, he, 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 he became the police commissioner, in effect, for London. And one of his first acts was to um, grant a budget of uh, two million pounds a year for people to go online, for cops to go online, and uh, investigate Islamophobia online. Oh, Jesus. And, and so there is a, you know, there's a budget for that. He, he, he's developed a policy for the... Uh, um, Metropolitan Police to investigate that. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you could be sure of that. <laughs> but, you know, it, it shows what could be done with, with this, this role. It's an important role that does actually have genuine power. And unfortunately, one of the things that I think um, people have tended to concentrate on is the sort of conventional um, elections where you, you become a councillor or you, become, or you could become an MP. Uh, those are, those are elections to positions where you're just a member of a, of a glorified committee. You have no actual power at all. Uh, and unless you've actually got the majority uh, on, in either the House of Commons or you've got the majority in the, uh, the council, you, you've got no decision-making power at all. So it, it becomes almost an impossible task. Whereas you could make a difference with some of the um, positions where you can be elected to something with real power. And those positions, at the moment, are police commissioners and directly elected mayors. Um, many of you will live in areas where there's a directly elected mayor. That mayor is the executive of that council. 
<laughs> they get to decide exactly the type of issues I'm talking about, uh, you know, with uh, budgets, policies, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a really important position, and, and it's a position that um, could be won if it was concentrated on. We did actually win the directly elected mayoralty of Doncaster a few years ago. Uh, it, you know, it, it can be done. So I, I'd uh, certainly urge people to do that. Um, and I'm also uh, uh, with, I've got three hats on, as it were, because uh, I'm also the chairman of the Workers of England Union. Um, and um, I'll, I'll speak a bit more about the Workers of England Union in a moment, but um, we are, I think, doing something really important with the Workers of England Union. And uh, last but not least, and I think this is actually the main capacity in which Gregory invited me, I'm an English solicitor. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, some years ago, the uh, eminent law lord, the late Lord Millet, uh, he once told me that there was a, a long tradition of lawyers, and I'm going to follow in that footstep, <coughs> complaining about the role of after-dinner speaker. And apparently the uh, story goes that uh, being an after-dinner speaker is actually worse uh, as a situation than Daniel in the lion's den. Now, you remember that's the... Um, story in chapter 6 of uh, the book of Daniel, well, uh, the older ones amongst you will remember, at any rate, the younger ones may have had um, the book of Daniel ex excised from your uh, curriculum. Um, but uh, what, what happened was that uh, during the Jewish Babylonian captivity of large parts of the tribes of Judah and of Benjamin, and that's not all the um, tribes of Israel, because uh, the rest were enslaved by the Assyrians sometime before after the fall of Samaria. Um, and you remember the story, perhaps, that Darius, the king of the Medes, he, he was tricked into um, uh, issuing an order that nobody was to uh, pray to their god. And uh, Daniel was then caught by his enemies, praying to his god, and he was dragged before Darius, and Darius was furious, but he realised he couldn't um, avoid... Um, putting Daniel into the uh, lion's den, which I think was a den where these uh, unfortunate lions that had been captured were had been chucked in there and uh, they were then used as a method of execution. Uh, and uh, obviously Daniel had two possibilities, um, but neither of which involved having to address the, uh, the diners. Um, either he was not going to be eaten, in which case there would be no dinner, or he'd be eaten and then he wouldn't be able to address them. So uh, that's, that's the uh, lawyer's um, idea of uh, why after-dinner speakers is uh, an undesirable role. Um, Lord Millet uh, was a Jewish old Herobian. His Jewishness was probably not so important in those days to him becoming a law lord because he was appointed and promoted under the old English legal system by the Lord Chancellor and the intention of that, legal, of that system of appointments was to appoint lawyers on merit. Uh, and he was appointed because he was an excellent lawyer. Uh, today, I'm not sure that even his Jewishness would have got him appointed as he was not a multiculturalist or a woke leftist. Um, since Tony Blair, Lord Irvin, and Lord Faulkner, all mates, created the Judicial Appointments Commission, the precondition for consideration for appointment or promotion to the bench is that the applicant must first demonstrate a lifetime's commitment to equality and diversity. A lifetime's commitment to equality and diversity. It's worth remembering that equality and diversity, if you look at them up in the dictionary, they're, they're contradictory words. Right? You, 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 can't, you can't have equality and diversity in, in dictionary terms. Um, however, the point, that, that, that sort of slightly misses the point because equality and diversity aren't intended to be interpreted literally. They are an official jargon for statist multiculturalist. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what you're dealing with, with. With almost any judge that you come across today, you are dealing with somebody who's been appointed on the basis that they can prove that they are a statist multiculturalist. Um, there, is a, there was a, a speech made at the time, which I think didn't get enough notice. Uh, which was made by Lord Irvin. Um, and he said what he'd done was he created an appointment system for the judiciary, which would mean that nobody with reactionary views could be appointed or promoted to the bench. 
Nobody with reactionary views could be appointed. And that's what the um, Judicial Appointments Commission is there to achieve. It's there to ensure that nobody with reactionary views can be appointed or promoted to the bench. And when you say the bench, you're not only talking about um, professional judges, you're also talking about magistrates, you're talking about the volunteers. Um, and so, therefore, if you've got a case that's actually inherently political, or you're trying to challenge the power of the state, you've actually got serious problems with these people. Um, and it's an important um, uh, development that's occurred there. Now, um, what does that mean in practice? Obviously, it does mean that, um, that your, your judges are mostly political activists. They are mostly social justice warriors, to use another expression. Um, but also there's another way in which you could possibly demonstrate the lifetime scrutiny to equality and diversity, which would mean that you, you qualified because of your protected characteristics. Um, and Joshua Rosenberg, uh, oh, Casey, oh. <laughs> who's um, probably the leading um, legal commentator um, in the uh, media, uh, he's obviously um, Jewish, and, um, he, and he, he said that um, in an article some years ago, uh, he, when the last uh, Master of the Rolls was promoted, he said, um, and I'm quoting more or less exactly, he said that he thought that um, diversity was making real progress in the appointment of the judiciary. And the test of that, and the, the fruit of that, was that um, out of the last eight Masters of the Rolls, and Master of the Rolls is one of the most senior judges, at the last eight Masters of the Rolls, seven had been Jewish and one was gay. <laughs> progress. That's progress. I'll give you another example, uh, perhaps you know, not about uh, Jewishness, but about, about um, political uh, opinion. Lady Hale, Brenda Hale. I mean, she was, she, she was a barrister, she qualified as a barrister. Um, she um, never really practiced much as a barrister. She was a, um, an academic, a not particularly distinguished academic, uh, a lecturer, I think, at Cambridge um, in law. And um, she got appointed by Labour, the Labour's uh, Judicial Appointments Commission. She got appointed uh, because, not because she was a good lawyer, she got appointed because she was a campaigning feminist. Uh, and Throughout her career on the bench, most lawyers that have appeared before her would sort of report that her decision making was not very good, but she nevertheless wound up being the president of the Supreme Court. Um, and that was because she did demonstrate a lifetime commitment to equality and diversity in her politics. Um, so you see, ladies and gentlemen, the judicial point system has been brought politically into line with the appointment system for the rest of the public sector, which is all committed to equality and diversity. And in terms of protected characteristics, the ideal tokenist candidate, the unholy grail, uh, would be, if you'll forgive me, the one-legged black lesbian <laughs> transsexual. <laughs> <laughs> then they would tick box almost everything. Uh, and. Um, so we aren't appointing on merit anymore. That has got to be really understood that you, when you're dealing with any part of the state, you aren't dealing with people who have been appointed on merit. They have, they have been appointed because they tick box part of the current tokenist agenda. I think it's worth sort of stepping back and thinking, you know, where does that kind of thought process come from? Where has it been applied? Well, I can tell you. It was applied in the Soviet Union. The whole idea of representative um, people who are appointed because they tick box something or other, that's how, that's how people were, were recruited to be um, in the Soviets. And of course, they were appointed by the Central Committee. They knew where their bread, how their bread was buttered. They knew they couldn't resist whatever was wanted. And they were, they were compliant. So it, it, is, it is part of a, a power agenda that does actually work and has, has been shown to work in terms of control. Um, and it is, I think, this selection system, an important part of the way in which liberal democracy has 
been transitioned, if you like the word, <laughs> into liberal authoritarianism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We cannot have a better example, I think, ladies and gentlemen, than the total collusion <coughs> over that recent but vast exercise in state power lockdown. <laughs> Consider in that the roles of the Lib Lab Con party. I, I like to think of the Lib Lab Con, really, as being yeah. <laughs> rather like a, um, a Punch and Judy show, an old-fashioned Punch and Judy show. You know, there's a lot of fighting going on on the stage, but it's actually only one person behind the curtain. <laughs> and it's a bit like that. I mean, it's not quite, quite right, but it gives you the idea. Um, the civil service. I mean, where was, where, where was any alternative way of thinking? No, they, they, were, they were the ones actually doing the party mostly, yes. weren't they? They knew. They knew that it, that it wasn't a serious threat to them. You wouldn't, go, you wouldn't have a drink and a party and a dance with your mates, as we saw in that recent film, uh, which was at least conservative um, activists. Um, you would, they wouldn't be doing that if they thought that that, that that could be a fatal risk to them. It's just ridiculous. The NHS, you know... They're, they're actually, there's, there's parts of the NHS where they're still wearing masks. Yes. Uh, e e even As though... Yesterday. Yeah, even, even though it's been uh, shown uh, quite conclusively that it makes virtually no difference whatsoever to wear a mask. And the pandemic uh, formerly closed on 6 o'clock. Yep, and before we ha were told to wear masks, Hancock was interviewed on television saying that it was pointless. It was, it was, it was social control rather yeah. than actually controlling the disease. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, scientific spokespersons. I've got to say person, haven't I? But think, of, think, of, think of that communist woman. What's her name? Michi? Oh, yes. yes. Susan Michi. Yes. 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 Um, you know, obviously, this is about state power. I mean, that's yes. what communists are about, isn't it? Care homes, professional regulators, um, shops, pubs, and churches, for heaven's sake. Yes. You know, they, they, all, they all shut and all colluded... And um, they all were <coughs> absolutely determined to suppress any contrary narratives. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, are you, are you aware of um, the Ofcom order that went out on the 19th yes. of March, in which basically all the media were told that they were not to report contrary narratives? And the Free Speech Union actually tried to challenge that in court. And they then, the, the Ofcom then argued that they weren't challenging contrary narratives. They were cha challenging um, uh, or not allowing any reporting of harmful ideas. Um, and uh, Eamon Holmes actually got fined, I think it was 8,000 quid for interviewing um, David Icke. He, you know, he didn't agree with him particularly, but he allowed him to go on air. That meant he got fined 8,000 quid because Icke was, was um, coming out with contrary narratives. That, that's the extent of the exercise that went on of collusion. Um, I think Lord Millet would have been for traditional English liberty, not for lockdown. He would have been with Lord Sumption, who's also Jewish, uh, and was the, uh, the retired Lord um, uh, Justice from the um, Supreme Court. Um, he would have been against Lord Burnett, who's our current Lord Chief Justice, at whose judgment in Dolan, in the Dolan case, um, showed that um, Burnett was so keen to enhance state power and to support it that he chucked out the whole of the legal rule which uh, had been adopted in English law to restrain indiscriminate regulations being produced by ministers. That's the doctrine of ultra-virus lawyers. Um, and we had, a, we, we had the, the, the uh, lawyers who were acting Dolan who I know, um, they were so expecting to win that on this other virus point that they, they had really sort of hung their entire argument around it. Because what, what we were dealing with with uh, lockdown was regulations sort of being produced under the uh, 1984 Act, appropriately enough, um, and um, it was the Control of Diseases, uh, Pu Public Health Control of Diseases Act, 1984. And uh, that act was about uh, controlling diseased people and goods coming off the docks. And it was magis magistrates had power to uh, impound um, infected goods and to um, quarantine uh, 
uh, infected people. It had, there was no power for the magistrates to um, impound or quarantine uninfected, and um, there was no uh, general power for ministers in that act, but yet it was used to create um, regulations which locked us all down. And Burnett, uh, in the Book of Appeal, he said that's fine, you know, in, 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 uh, in an emergency we can use uh, any power, um, create any regulation, even on an act that's nothing to do with it. That is how far the level of collusion went in the law. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, I, I had another role. Um, as chairman of the uh, Workswing Union, I'm proud to say that we are the only trade union which stood up for our members during lockdown, and we were willing to oppose lockdown, vaccine mandates, and masks. Um, we had a member come to us who um, came to us from the Labour Sporting Trade Union, Unison, Oh. And um, she'd been a member of Unison for about 15 years. She paid all her subs, uh, never asked them to do anything. She's a, um, a lady who's got uh, severe asthma, and she was told she'd got to wear a mask, which would have been a serious problem for her. Um, so she went to her union and said, um, I need some help. And they said they weren't going to give us any help. They actually were foolish enough to put it in writing. Um, they weren't going to give her any help because it was against Labour Party policy. That's where you are with uh, many of the trade unions. Um, we've also uh, championed uh, patriots uh, and uh, traditionists, and we're proud to do so. Um, and uh, I was uh, talking to one of your uh, members um, earlier uh, who was enthusiastic about the fact we, we actually won a case where um, we got a ruling. Well, at any rate, we got, we got a ruling. We haven't, we haven't finished with it because we're still appealing to try and make sure that the ruling is, is complete. Um, but uh, we got a ruling that uh, uh, English nationalism is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. And if somebody discriminates against you as an English nationalist, you can sue them. Or if you lose your job because uh, you, you, you're an English nationalist, you can sue them. And that's exactly what actually happened in that particular case. This guy lost his job uh, because it was discovered that he was an English nationalist. Um, and. Um, I thought, as a, an English Democrat, uh, workers of England Union, you, you, you might, in the traditional Britain group, challenge me on whether there's any difference between uh, Englishness and Britishness. Um, and um, so I just thought I'd tell you the story of the Englishman, the Irishman, and the Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is a, an old sort of trope <laughs> in, in, uh, in Britain. Um, and um, the, these uh, three guys had got themselves out of the uh, green zone in Iraq um, when um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq were running amok, and they were captured by Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and they were bundled into the back of a, of a, of a van, hooded, and then they were dragged out, uh, and uh, at that point, uh, they were given a, 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 an offer, which was that they could have one final wish before they're executed on, uh, on television. And uh, the Irishman was the quickest of the of three, because he said, um, what, any final wish? Can we have any final wish? Oh, yes, any final wish. Uh, oh, he said, in that case, I'd like to see a live performance of a thousand dancers dancing the river dance. Uh, and uh, the archive people said, okay. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the Scotsman, picked it up at this point, and he said, um, well, he, what he'd like to see was a, a live performance of a thousand pipers um, uh, playing Flower of Scotland. Uh, and they then turned to the Englishman and said, um, well, what's your wish? And he said, please kill me first. <laughs> uh, well, they said, well, I was... I was billed in my role as an English solicitor um, to tell you about my case against one of the Rotherham Pakistani Muslim child rape and pimping gang members. Um, but I, I think it needs perhaps um, a bit of history to explain. But many of you will know that this is probably the greatest 
scandal that's occurred for decades uh, in the country. Um, we are talking about, well, I think the sort of minimum estimate is about 100,000 girls. Um, we are talking tens of thousands of gang members, uh, both the, the actual people who are recruiting, um, grooming, as the expression now is, these girls, and basically then pimping them to a large number of um, Pakistani Muslim men, um, at, at least 10,000 uh, clients of these gangs. Um, each girl uh, is said to have been worth something in the order of a quarter of a million a year to the gangs. So they made a huge amount of money out of this. Uh, and the, the, the scandal, you know, it's bad enough that that's what, what's going on. But the scandal is even worse than that, because all those whose job it was to do something about this and to prevent this kind of thing, they just colluded. Oh. So the police, you know, the police, you've got to bear in mind, the senior ranks of the police are, are politically appointed uh, or selected. Uh, they were not prepared to challenge this. These, a lot of these things happened in labor areas uh, where the labor was a sort of one-party state, yeah. obviously the most famous of which, or infamous of which is Rotherham, <laughs> uh, where there was a, an authoritative report done showing that in Rotherham alone, which is not a very big place, uh, there were at least, and I mean at least, 1,400 girls that had been pimped and raped in this way as underage, um, underage girls. Uh, and um, the police just simply weren't prepared to investigate. In fact, in the case that I was dealing with, that I'll come to in a minute, uh, the, the girl's father tracked down where she was. She'd been, she'd been she was in a uh, motel room. There were eight uh, Pakistani Muslim uh, adult men there in the room with her. She was partly undressed, she was drunk, uh, she was aged 14, uh, and um, he, he couldn't get them to release the girl, so he called the police, uh, and they just arrested him. They didn't, they didn't do anything about the, uh, the men in the room. They didn't rescue the girl. Uh, they, um, they basically colluded with the whole thing. Uh, social, social services were just as much involved. Um, in fact, many of the girls were supposedly in care of social services um, it, because it was a cheap area. Um, girls who were taken into care from, in, for instance, Essex were often shipped up to that sort of area and then they were part of the, um, the uh, pimping. It's not the one with poison in it. <laughs> um, I think it's a scandal which shows vividly just how abject and immoral and undutiful the British establishment multiculturalists actually are. My purpose in getting involved um, in um, this type of case was to try to achieve better justice for the victim. Um, and that's, I think, important. It's not only um, that, that in many cases the police were unwilling to do anything about this, and they still are to the point where um, most of those where the, the men have been prosecuted have actually been prosecuted as a result of the National Crime Agency being got involved, um, not the local police. Um, but also the, the punishments were... You know, almost trivial, really. I mean, this, this, this girl that I was acting for, um, her rapist, who, who had, her first rapist, uh, she was a 14-year-old virgin. She was lured into this flat. She was then raped, uh, um, made drunk, and uh, then raped by this guy. He was convicted of two rapes of a 14-year-old girl. Um, there were other rapes, but... Um, they were, they, it was not uh, possible to convict. Bear in mind that conviction has to be beyond all reasonable doubt. So the slightest doubt is on the side of the, uh, of the, of the criminal. Um, but he was convicted of two. And he was sentenced to eight years in prison, I think, in nine. Uh, two years he spent in a 
Prof Prison, and then uh, two years he spent in Open Prison. Um, open Prison, uh, I, I didn't go to the one that he was in, but I, I'm aware, for instance, the one at Lay Hill uh, in Gloucestershire. It's got a nine-hole golf course, it's got a swimming pool, it's got squash courts, it's even got a bar. <laughs> Uh, and um, I, I, I was aware of, of somebody who'd been uh, sent down for years of, um, supposedly years of imprisonment for a, a massive fraud, and uh, he got bored, so he, he signed up for Open University, he got day release, um, and he was out of, the, out of it twice, twice a week, um, and um, you know, he reckoned that the only downside to the whole thing, um, frankly, was um, the other prisoners some of whom were um, actually dangerous. Um, but this guy spent two years in, in open prison. He's now been released. Um, he's, uh, uh, it's probably only now, let's think, um, we might be about the fifth, maybe sixth year since he was convicted. Um, he's, he's, he doesn't serve a, he don't, they, don't, they don't serve a full term or whatever they're sentenced to. So it's not, it's not much of a, a punishment, really, for the horrendous things that these people got up to. Um, and I, I thought that it's also um, suing these people um, is actually probably a much more effective attack on the business model of these gangs. Because these people are mostly, the, the gang members are mostly rich now, having done this, and they are um, you know, important people in their communities. If you take the money off them, uh, then um, they won't be important people in their communities, um, and they won't be rich. Um, and so, what um, I tried to do was to um, find some way of uh, getting into contact with somebody to, to bring one of these cases. And um, so I, I tried advertising in the Rotherham Advertiser which um, you might think would be willing to take an advert from a solicitor to act in a particular type of case. No, you'd be wrong. Um, they were not prepared to take the advert. But then if you, think, if you step back and think about it, it wasn't just the officials who were colluding. It was also the journalists. I mean, the journalists would have known that something was going on. They couldn't possibly have not known. Um, and, uh, of course, they didn't want to advertise for... Um, people to be sued who were in the groups that they were, um, had been colluding with. Um, anyway, uh, I was in contact with Alan Craig of Hearts of Oak, um, and he made contact with Jane Senior, who was one of the few conscientious social workers in Rotherham, and um, together they found a victim who was brave enough to be the icebreaker, to bring the icebreaker or pathfinder case. She is officially known as Liz, capital I, capital, capital L, capital I, capital Z. Um, but what we have now done is we've mapped out, or blazed the trail, whichever expression you want to use, um, and others can follow. And what you need is you need a brave victim, you need relevant convictions, and you need the perpetrator to have assets. Um, and if you've got that, you've got a situation where some serious justice can be, can be brought to bear. Um, and um, two rape convictions when, um, a four, when as a 14-year-old child, he'd obviously ruined her life. Going through his name. We've got a doctor who reported that as a result of her two rapes, which caused her post-traumatic stress disorder, it caused, those two rapes caused 60% of her permanent psychological damage. So we then got an accountant uh, to calculate um, what a whole life loss of earnings uh, would be, and we applied 60% to it. So that is, in effect, the minimum award for, for, for um, my client's case. Um, and uh, it's also not only earnings, but pension loss. Before we got into that, what we, what we did was we got a freezing order beforehand, so he couldn't, he couldn't ship his assets overseas. And we got an anonymity order, um, which um, would reduce, 
together reduce the risk of transferring assets and also reduce the risk of the claimant. So others won't know who she is. And ladies and gentlemen, the result of doing that is we got a judgment for £426,000. We're now focusing on enforcement of the judgment and we expect to sell the defendant's house. Um, and we've also got other victims who are thinking of suing too. And so there is a real prospect that we might actually be able to achieve something in destroying the economic basis of these um, gangs, uh, what, they, what they're doing. So I, I think, it, I think it's, it is an important step in the right direction. I don't say it cures all wrongs, of course it doesn't. But uh, you've, got to, you've got to pick fights that you can win, yeah. and uh, you've got to focus on those rather than um, be, being too scattergun in the approach, I think. And that's what we've tried to do with this. And celebrate all the Robin will take a few questions. I, I, before we take questions, I think I'd better get you all to stand up and um, drink a toast, haven't I, to the traditional Britain group? Yes. yes. And our excellent organiser, Gregory. Gregory. Thank you very much. <laughs> Robin, very, very many thanks for coming to speak to us tonight. Um, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Your, your